Hello. It is April 2nd. I'm Dr. Coates. This is another edition of Visual Poetry. The lecture today is about is called Negative Aesthetics on the Syllabus, which is actually a, a term taken from the, uh, the, the German philosopher Theodor Adorno. Um, and I, just, just to be absolutely clear, I was being kind of cute with that. Uh, if you look it up on Wikipedia or attempt to read the book, you will find that Negative Aesthetics actually means something quite different than what I'm talking about here today, which is just... Um, well, I'll, I'll be talking about it for the rest of the time. So um, I will explain myself in time. But it does, I, for me at least, uh, encapsulate what we're doing with the poems for this week, all of which have a theme that I set up in my lecture from last Thursday by talking about anthropomorphic poems that gesture beyond the limits of human subjectivity toward whatever exists beyond human subjectivity, beyond what human beings can know or even imagine. But whereas last week's animal poems provided an inhuman but still living perspective through which to filter the imagined loss of the speaker's humanity, this week's poems are basically about death, about what happens after that moment of death. There's no getting around the end in these poems. They're about the end. There's only the unknowable task of imagining what can't be conceived of by definition. So first of all, let me go ahead and disambiguate, uh, as I'm very fond of saying, from having spent a lot of my time on Wikipedia lately. Uh, this week we're not talking about poems that have as their subject matter coming to terms with the death of someone else. This is called an elegy. Uh, it's a literary poetic genre which has its own exceptionally rich history and set of conventions, some of which are derived from ancient Greek fertility rituals, and I'm not making that up. Uh, in an elegy, the speaker is a mourner, mourner of the dead person, uh, which, who is the subject of the poem, and that speaker goes through the same stages that Elizabeth Kubler-Ross talks about in her book On Death and Dying, denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and finally acceptance. Um, elegies start out with what is known variously as either a threnody or a dirge, a combination of denial and anger, uh, mostly designed to let the reader know why the departed was particularly special or will be particularly missed. Uh, by the speaker. The bargaining stage in ancient Greece involved laying flowers over the pyre of the departed uh, as a sacrifice to Demeter, the goddess of the harvest and of regeneration, who by bestowing her favor might transform the dead into the living and also thereby the win winter into spring. It's a little bit late this year, I guess. Um, anyway, even in the Christian era, it is still traditional in elegies um, to feature descriptions of flowers as a gift to the heavens to ensure the, f the future happiness of the departed. Right? But after depression sets in for the speaker, that fourth stage, who has no other way to affect the afterlife for the departed than to lay some flowers, which during this stage look particularly lame as an offering, um, that person, the speaker, is now faced with loneliness. Unless something can be done to change his or her outlook, uh, at that point acceptance occurs. And usually we get what is known in poetry as an apotheosis. This is a description of what the afterlife will be like and why the speaker trusts in the happiness of the departed spirit. So for example in one of the typical pastoral elegies um, uh, it's called Lycidas by uh, John Milton. Um, Lycidas is the sort of classical name which is given to his friend Edward King, Milton's friend Edward King, uh, who unfortunately died of drowning uh, when he was still a student um, and it goes through these stages, the last of which is an apotheosis. Uh, the thing that Milton comes up with is that King, or Blicitus in this case, is uh, going to spend his afterlife in, because he enjoyed being a scholar so much, he's going to be in some colossal library, like the British Museum Library or something like that, um, which is good. It's good for him because he loved to study, and so he'll be able to do that for all time. So don't worry about Lycidas, gentle reader. Uh, Milton has done him justice through this particular apotheosis. Also, because uh, a lot of what made Lycidas special was his promise as a poet, uh, we, we can rest assured too that Milton, also an awesome poet, or perhaps much more awesome because he's able to represent his friend so aptly, uh, will continue on. And in fact, he then writes Paradise Lost. So good for us, but not so much for Edward King, who stays dead. Anyway, far from being an attempt to imagine what life looks like when you remove the human element from the equation, though, the elegy as a genre is a profoundly humanist sort of poem. It's all about human beings and the universal agreement that death is tough to deal with, perhaps the toughest thing to deal with in this life. Uh, but elegies are really about other human beings working through loss in order to transform it into coping strategies, a process Sigmund Freud called introjection. Uh, but it's basically working through your grief. And while the departed subject is certainly imagined, it would be cold comfort indeed if the dead 
were imagined as having simply ceased, or if the apotheosis did not include some sort of optimistic resolution. You don't see pessimistic apotheoses very often, um, because they just they hurt very much if you're uh, among the grieving. I suppose depicting the world without the self is the ultimate challenge for human genres. Um, but on the other hand, I could also rephrase the task and wonder why it should be hard at all. Perhaps writing poetry about what the world looks like uh, without that which we have trained ourselves to think of as the center of sense-making, the self, shouldn't be all that difficult. Maybe it's just another way of describing objective poetry rather than subjective poetry. Maybe we just need to you know, stop opining so much and you know, state things as they are. Um, maybe that's uh, just simply talking about a poetry which would be light on interpretation but heavy on description. Except, except, description still only occurs when something that, that can look about and analyze your eyes, right, and sift through data, uh, the, the optic nerve I suppose, reports back on what the data mean, right? Uh, when we look about, in other words, we are still interpreting what we are seeing on a baseline fundamental level. Even if it doesn't take on what we might consider to be the higher order interpretive registers like moral judgment, finding larger patterns, um, coming to some sort of grand revolution, revelation or conclusion uh, about what things mean. Um, this is one of the reasons that artificial intelligence has proven so difficult for computer scientists to design. They are still stuck on relatively minor functions of the human brain, uh, which, are, which, which the brain normally processes effortlessly, like how to recognize a smile out of someone moving the muscles in their face and lips in a particular configuration. Right? We find that relatively easy, but uh, robots don't. Um, because they're not human, right? So it's hard to project ourselves into anthropomorphic robots, uh, as lifelike as they can sometimes appear. It's hard, too, to imagine what interpretation might look like to a slightly altered version of ourselves that lacks some, but importantly not all, of the characteristics that we ascribe to ourselves. Uh, we read Sail Yeats's Sailing to Byzantium a few weeks ago, which some, have, some scholars have described as a sort of self-elegy, um, you know, kind of like imagining his own funeral or saying goodbye to life uh, even though he's, he doesn't die for the, the, the poet himself didn't die for well, I don't know, a good 14 years after writing that poem that poem includes a dirge at the beginning his rage at the youth of Ireland and an apotheosis at the end when he becomes an immortal golden bird uh, throughout literary history birds have often been figures of aspiration and of the human soul so perhaps it's not too hard to see even if you hadn't thought about it this way and, and before Perhaps it's not too hard to see how Byzantium could be a metaphor for heaven or some, some other sort of idyllic afterlife for the speaker. But the artificial bird that Yeats describes has had to be stripped of all its human desires and bodily appetites. He tells the sages who are standing in God's holy fire to consume his heart away with a purgatorial fire. So it's not just so it's just his mind which is sort of projected into this bird, not his body. Um, Right? It's, it's his mind and not his body that sails to Byzantium. And there are definite consequences, including, I would argue, the loss of some, if not all, of his poetic inspiration. Merely thinking about what it's like to live in Byzantium makes him a worse poet. If you go back and look at the last stanza of this poem, Sailing to Byzantium, you'll see that he mentions gold an awful lot, four times in three lines at one point. I'm not saying that gold isn't great or that it's not a precious metal. It is. But for a poet, and remember, poets normally pride themselves on their creativity and the pro proliferation of their vocabulary. For him to rely so heavily on the same term over and over again, it should probably make us stop and wonder. Perhaps the speaker lost some of his old poetic inspiration when his bodily desires were stripped from him. Perhaps there is reason to regret immortality if it can only be gained at the expense of that essential something that made the speaker yearn for it in the first place, and, after all, what made uh, the monuments of its own magnificence that were his earlier poems, right? So even, in other words, um, even though he might regret the fact that he's no longer as, as young as he was, um, as he starts to imagine what it would take in order for him to get outside of life and become a golden bird rather than an elderly poet, right? Uh, he starts to draw back a little bit from that desire to go to Byzantium because he still likes himself as a poet, someone who r writes really beautiful poetry um, rather than someone who's immortal. Um, and has like a nice perspective from outside being outside of nature but has lost you know the desire that made him uh, an outstanding love poet in his youth right because he no longer has his heart or his I guess urges <laughs> anyway nevertheless the poems we read for today are about an attempt to speak to something that is fundamentally not like us or to imagine what life would be like if we were not only not ourselves but not human at the same time 
This happens in the idea of order at Key West when the speaker, this is the Wallace Stevens poem, when the speaker notices that the song of the woman walking along the shore somehow also contains the voice of the ocean, which is sublimely larger than human beings. It's huge, as you know, those of you who have been to the beach. The question then becomes whether the woman's song is a song of a human being come to, coming to terms with the otherness of the ocean, which would be a profoundly humanist response to nothingness, right? Making something out of, or making the, the nothingness of the ocean mean something to human beings, right? Or, at the very least, a landscape evacuated of humanist personification. Or, it's the voice of the ocean, which would again be different from personification because the voice of the ocean is inhuman, frightening, and unintelligible, right? So it's either the speaker is, is putting a voice to the ocean but imagining it as a human being, you know, like the ocean speaking as a human being, which would be the song. Or the ocean is speaking, but it's not human, and that's partly why it's terrifying. Those are, it's, amb it's ambiguous. And that ambiguity is carried within the song of the woman and then conveyed to us through the observations of the probably male speaker who is listening to her and coming to grips with the fact that the song is not what he was expecting. Okay, that, it's a fairly complex poem, I agree, but um, at the same time, it, it has that really profound ambiguity, which I think if, if you read it through once and didn't like it, um, probably warrants at least one more go-through, uh, especially if you're trying to grapple with the, the issues that I'm talking about in this lecture. So, in theory, it's possible to mentally shed layer after layer of selfhood, usually through prayer or meditation, trying to imagine a universe that does not orbit around you the star and protagonist of your own feature-length biopic, right? The religious philosopher Simon Weil called this decreation, a sort of willing of oneself toward the extinction of subjectivity, the better to comprehend the universe as it is, rather than the universe as a reflection of our own egos, the universe as we wish it were, right? This is what happens in Emily Dickinson's I'm Nobody, Who Are You? Uh, one of our fake poets is uh, taking on that persona this week. And all, it also happens in John Keats's When I Have Fears That I May Cease to Be. Um, both of these poems are, are explicit goodbyes to those aspects of the self that had, up to a point, been reliable providers of meaning to our existence. But now, not so much. Now, Dickinson's poem, of course, is much more sanguine about the task of unimagining the imagination than Keats's, which makes sense because, at that point, Keats was dying of tuberculosis and you know, would probably be terrified about impending mortality. But, um, but other quarters, environmentalist discourse is chief among, among these quarters. And, and in English, I don't know if this was clear, we, we actually call this eco-criticism, um, any sort of way of trying to read literature that um, carries with it uh, to like the, the base theories of environmentalism uh, as it's raison d'etre. Uh, we call this practice post-humanism, uh, th this sort of decreationist impulse to try to imagine what the universe would be like if we didn't insist on human beings being uh, the dominant paradigm, or the valuation of, of everything uh, in the universe according to how useful human beings can make it, which is the, the dominant paradigm, if that is subverted and instead everything is on an equal playing field. Um, if you believe in posthumanism, you regard the process of trying to decreate yourself less as the death of the self than as the reprioritization of the universe over the prerogatives of the self. And this is actually good news because it means that we can still be alive after we, human beings, surrender sole custody of the planet uh, or of our language or of our consciousnesses uh, and thereby say, you know, it's not just that I'm a, the, uh, a single cell and no one ever intrudes upon me, but that other people are involved in the things that I know, right? I'm pausing for dramatic emphasis, I guess. Uh, or of our meanings, uh, the idea that I'm not uh, the, the sole creator of, of what things mean, but that other people are involved in those meanings too. Rather than needing to think about ourselves as being literally actually decreated or destroyed if we, sh if we should think about the end of our subjectivity. right? So you can either think about death as being the end and that nothing could ever go go on beyond you, or you can consider that the universe will probably continue quite well without you, should you uh, have to pass away. And this is a choice that we all make, I think. Uh, if you believe that the universe is predicated upon you, that nothing would exist without you, then you would find saying goodbye kind of a terrifying thing. So you wouldn't want the rest of the universe to be destroyed when you, when you passed. Anyway, 
probably will be alright after you go. I hope so. Um, although I'll probably go before you. <laughs> anyway, this impulse, this post-humanist impulse, is what I'll be talking about on Thursday, so I suppose I should leave off for now. Uh, until then, keep tweeting in the Fake Poets activity. Have fun, and remember that these are, are uh, personae who are trying to speak to you from beyond themselves, which is really deep. Try to take them up on it uh, from, you know, in the spirit in which all of this is, is given. Um, and not only have a good time, but uh, be well until I see you next on Thursday.